Hello, I'm Rebecca Deschweinitz, and as a member of the Dialogue Foundation Board, I'm pleased to welcome you all to Dialogue Gospel Study on Helaman 1 through 6 with our guest instructor, Dr. Daniel Becerra. In addition to myself, fellow board members Michael Austin and Chris Kimball may also make appearances as they help out with technical issues and some discussion. With our webinar format, everyone who is joining us on Zoom will be able to post comments and ask questions through the chat function. As always, please be respectful and relevant as you do so. We anticipate having some discussion near the end of the lesson. We are also live on Facebook, so welcome to folks tuning in over there as well. Our previous lessons are all available in video and podcast form. Check us out at dialoguejournal.com, where you can also find the entire 50 plus years of the journal. If you enjoy these gospel study lessons and Dialogue's other longstanding efforts to promote diverse perspectives and some of the faith's most vibrant thinking through scholarship, poetry, fiction, personal essays, visual art, and more, we invite you to help support Dialogue's mission and initiatives. Donations can be made through the website or by texting a number that I should have, but that we'll make available um, and post in chat. We are thrilled to have Professor Daniel Becerra teaching us today. Dr. Becerra is an assistant professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University and a scholar of early Christianity. He holds secondary specialties in New Testament and Greco-Roman philosophy. He received a PhD in religion and an MA in religious studies from Duke University, a master's in theological studies in New Testament and early Christianity from Harvard Divinity School, and a bachelor's degree in ancient Near Eastern studies from BYU. His primary research interests concern moral formation in late antiquity, particularly within Christian ascetic contexts. He also researches topics relating to ethics and spirituality in the Book of Mormon. He is the author of the forthcoming book, Third and Fourth Nephi, A Brief Theological Introduction, which will be published this year by the Neil A. Maxwell Institute of Religious Scholarship. And I think I just saw something this week that it's been released. Maybe I'm wrong. He lives in Spanish Fork, Utah with his <laughs> wife and three children. We are grateful to Dr. Becerra for his preparation and willingness to teach us today. As is true with any Latter-day Saint scripture study class, the views expressed today will be those of the individual teacher and do not necessarily reflect those of the Dialogue Foundation, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, BYU, or any other organization. We'll begin today with music, the Lord's Prayer, sung in Aramaic and recorded at the Monastery of St. Mark in Jerusalem. After that, Nicole Gurley will offer our opening prayer. Nicole, who is Daniel's sister, is mother to one daughter and lives in Spokane, Washington. He earned a master's degree in English literature at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which is my hometown, and we've discovered quite an Alaska connection among many of our participants today. And she teaches English as a second language. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this wonderful day. We're grateful for the opportunity to be edified by Dr. Becerra. And we're grateful for the efforts of everyone involved to bring this to a larger audience. Please bless Dr. Becerra that he may have the words and the spirit necessary to help us feel the spirit and to be effective in his teaching. Please bless us that we may have a more personal interaction with the scriptures, that we may, that through this discussion, we may be able to understand our role as followers of Christ. Please bless us that we may take what we've learned today and apply them to our lives and, and to be an influence and a power for good. We love thee very much and we're grateful for everything that thou hast given us. And we love thee very much again. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So good to go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen, Rebecca. Uh, let me know if I'm gonna put it in presenter mode. 
and let me know if you can see my notes. Um, okay, do you see any notes off to the side or anything? No? My screen kind of changed around a bit, so I don't have like the normal screen. Okay. So I'm not sure. <laughs> Savannah, can you see no my notes presenter notes? No? Okay, no good. <laughs> Just let me know if you can, because, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so as Rebecca said, let me minimize this real quick, sorry. As Rebecca said, uh, my formal training is in early Christian history and, and more specifically in different conceptions of perfection and, and how people can form themselves to those ideals. So when I read texts, um, I often... I often think about how they relate to, to morality and discipleship and what precisely that looks like, um, what good people do or, or feel or think or experience. And this is important because the gospel of Jesus Christ at its heart, I think, is, is, is more than a system of belief or a code of conduct. It's a system of becoming intended to help, um, help us become more Christ-like persons. So as we go through the text today, I would encourage you to be mindful about how the Book of Mormon portrays goodness and ask yourselves, where do I stand in, in relation to that ideal? And this is something that um, hopefully we can talk about a little bit after my, after my comments. Uh, and along the way, of course, I, I hope to draw out some of my own conclusions and offer some of my own insights. Um, now, to begin, it might be helpful to, to situate ourselves within the context of the narrative, uh, which can often be divided according to the reign of different judges. Excuse me. So please bear with me as I give you a quick outline uh, of the scripture block. Um, this might help just uh, navigate our way through the, through the passages. So Helaman opens up with contentions arising among the Nephites regarding who should occupy the judgment seat. Um, because of all the infighting, the Nephites become vulnerable to attack uh, by the Lamanites who capture and then lose the city of Zarahemla. You then have the rise of the Gadianton robbers who enter into secret covenants to obtain power and authority. Uh, and Mormon depicts this group as responsible in part for the destruction of the Nephite people. And as Kim Berkey has pointed out in her recent brief theological introduction to the Book of Helaman, this is actually the first time in the Book of Mormon where Mormon tells us in his own voice that the Nephite people will be destroyed. He certainly gestures towards that uh, throughout his narrative throughout the large plates from the Book of Mosiah onwards, but this is the first time he explicitly says it. And he's very careful in crafting his narrative in Helaman, Helaman in a way that helps the readers uh, see why precisely the Nephites are inevitably going to be destroyed. Now, beginning in chapter 3, uh, Mormon tells us that uh, there were many contentions and dissensions in Zarahemla, and a great many people left the land to settle elsewhere, both Nephites and Lamanites. Uh, Helaman becomes judge and executes his office in righteousness, and it's during this time that the people and the church prosper, and there's peace in the land. Uh, after several years, the people start becoming prideful, and Helaman passes the judgeship down to his son Nephi. You have then uh, dissensions in the church, which lead to war and bloodshed between the Nephites and Lamanites and Nephi dissenters. And then Nephi yields up the judgment seat to his son, or to rather to Sizorum, so that he can dedicate himself to preaching. And then he and Lehi, who is his missionary companion, are successful, which leads to further peace and prosperity uh, until the Gadianton robbers emerge again. Now, I apologize, I realize that was maybe a little bit boring, but I, <laughs> I want to kind of get it out there at the beginning because much of these chapters uh, are narratives of conflicts between groups and individuals, so we don't get a lot of sermons or extended uh, theological discussion that you would get, say, in the Book of Alma or Mosiah. Um, but we do see a few important themes emerge that I would like to draw out and reflect on. And these themes are, are obviously present elsewhere in the Book of Mormon, um, so I hope it's okay that I also jump around uh, the book in, in an effort to provide a broader understanding of them. Now, the first theme I want to draw out is the relationship between morality and prosperity. Um, so Mormon, as I said, who's narrating the story to us, he tells us that uh, war and contentions began to cease among the Nephites and that there was continual peace in all the land on account of their righteousness. And during this time, the Nephites and Lamanites, they traveled freely, they engaged in commerce with one another, uh, and both groups were blessed with exceeding prosperity and exceeding great riches, he tells us. And this consisted of gold and silver, all manner of precious metals. Now, in reporting Nephite history to us in Helaman, Mormon consistently correlates the Nephites' moral fluctuations to their temporal prosperity. 
And in doing so, he demonstrates how economic and moral discourse converge in the Book of Mormon, which is to say, he, he, he demonstrates how talking about wealth and prosperity and how talking about righteousness converge. Now, uh, this correlation of temporal prosperity and, and morality also permeates Mormon's other writings in the large plates and can be summarized as follows. Uh, first, God often blesses the righteous with wealth. So wealth comes in various forms, um, precious metals or flocks or clothes or trading goods, architecture, etc. cetera. Uh, wealth also tends to lead to wickedness. Typically it's pride, greed, and persecution. And this is the case more often than not. And I think one, things is, one thing this means is that the Book of Mormon offers us a kind of master class in failing morally when things are going well temporally. So one of the questions I'll raise in a moment, and hopefully we can be thinking about this for the, for the end um, when I'm done and we can discuss a little bit, is what does it look like to succeed morally when one is succeeding temporally? What does righteousness look like in times of prosperity? And I ask that question because, uh, at least based on my own personal experience, it's much easier to be, uh, have a close, sincere relationship with God when things are going bad, because that's when I feel like I really need him. But when things are going well, I feel less inclined and less able to muster the sincerity necessary to kind of have that open level of communication. Now next, uh, wickedness typically leads to suffering and poverty. Sometimes this is in the form of God kind of removing his protection of a people so they become vulnerable to their enemies. Other times God actually curses the land or the people's possessions. Um, and we see this uh, later on in Helaman. In Helaman, God curses the treasures of the Nephites so that they become slippery. Um, so they can't like hold on to them when they bury them and they, get, they go away, essentially. Uh, finally, suffering and poverty can, but do not necessarily always, uh, lead to righteousness. Um, suffering and poverty are use, uh, useful when they lead to humility and repentance, but they aren't idealized in and of themselves. Um, suffering and poverty in the Book of Mormon exists in large part to be eradicated. Uh, and this is sometimes uh, referred to as the pride cycle. You can probably recognize it. And I, I lay all this out because I want to emphasize that Mormon's discussion of prosperity is never just about economics. It's never just about what to do with blessings and temporal wealth. It's also theological. Uh, when, within his historical narrative, uh, people's relationship with wealth is inseparable from their relationship with God and, and one another. So wealth affects and reflects personal and communal morality in Mormon's writings. Now, getting back to Helaman 1 through 6, uh, I want to draw out two things. So beginning in chapter 3, Mormon introduces us to the idea that one of the Nephites' chief problems was pride. He tells us in verse 1 that uh, in the 43rd year of the reign of the judges, there was only a little pride. By the time you get to the, 15th, uh, the 53rd year, which is 10 years later, uh, he notes that there was exceeding great pride. He then explains that this was because of their exceeding great riches and their prosperity in the land. Now, the Nephites' uh, problems with wealth and greed and pride are first mentioned all the way back in Jacob, so this isn't, uh, this isn't a new problem for them. But I want to pose two interrelated questions here. Uh, what is pride and what is the problem with pride? And I think at its heart, pride is an inordinate self-esteem, and I'm, I'm taking that from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Uh, so what, pride, in a sense, is a preference and valuation of oneself over others. And based on these verses here on the screen, Helaman 3, uh, 1, 33 through 36, um, pride can be both an individual and communal attribute, which is, to say, which is to say it's described as entering into the church as a whole and into the individual hearts of individual persons. So to better get a sense for why pride is a problem, um, we need to understand the function of the heart in the Book of Mormon because that's where the heart, that's where pride is seated. Um, now, typically we talk about the heart as the seat of our emotions. We say things like, I love you with all my heart. And what we mean by that is that the heart is kind of the emotional center. It's where our feelings reside. Uh, but in the Book of Mormon, the heart has a much broader range of meaning. So for example, uh, it's, it's responsible for three different human functions. And the first is cognition, things that we typically think of as we're doing with our mind. Uh, so, for example, you'll see phrases like uh, the thoughts of the heart, or he understood in his heart, uh, foolish imaginations of the heart, I pondered in my heart, 
Um, sometimes hard hearts are unable to believe in things that are true and soft hearts are more malleable and therefore able to believe things that are true. So the heart is somehow associated with idea and the capacity to believe. Um, hearts are also associated with remembering specifically the things of God and of conceiving. Uh, the second thing that the heart is responsible for is emotion. Um, the, the heart is described as being the seat of about 19 different emotional experiences in the Book of Mormon, ranging from uh, joy and sorrow to fear to anxiety, guilt, depression. And some of these, as you can see on the screen, uh, overlap with one another. Um, but the, the power of emotion is definitely something that's in the heart's uh, capacity. And then finally, the heart is responsible for volition. And by volition, I mean desire, uh, intent, ardor, appetite. You'll see phrases like the desires of her heart or with full purpose of heart, full intent of heart, full sincerity of heart, in, uh, wishing with the heart. So these are all the things that the heart does in the Book of Mormon. Now I, I spell all that out because if pride is uh, inordinate self-esteem and if the locus is the pr uh, pride is the heart, and if the heart is responsible for all these different human functions, how is pride manifested differently in Helaman and in the larger book, 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 book of Mormon. And I'll offer a few of my own thoughts that I've noticed, but this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, the first is that the heart um, or pride is uh, at, at, at its foundation, I think, an assumption of personal superiority. We think we're better than other people. And it's worth noting that this is typically the problem with righteous people before it is with the wicked people. You become wicked by thinking that you're better but being righteous somehow lends itself to thinking that you're better than other people. Um, and this might be something for uh, members of the church uh, to consider because we typically frame our relationship to others in language of chosenness and of being uh, elect people, uh, of being a light to the world, of being the salt of the earth. So we can ask ourselves, how do we understand these metaphors of identity without adopting a posture of assumed superiority over those different from us? If pride is a problem of the righteous, then this is definitely a problem I think that we should, we should be aware of. Correspondingly, pride typically uh, leads us to have a low valuation of other people, which is to say we, we fail to see them through God's eyes. Um, I'm reminded specifically of D&C 18.10, in which um, the Lord says the worth, of the, soul, the worth of souls is great in the eyes of God. Or the sons of Mosiah, who could not bear that any human soul should perish, Yea, even the very thoughts that any soul should endure endless torment did cause them to quake and tremble. The three Nephite disciples, their deepest desire was to bring souls to Christ. And I think these desires are born of, of, of the ability to see others through the Lord's eyes and not as less than ourselves. Uh, pride also in the Book of Mormon is associated with forgetting the, Lord's and the Lord and his blessings. Um, so the assumption that good things happening to us are because of who we are and what we do. Uh, so we fail to recognize the Lord's hand in our happiness, as it were. Emotional. Um, so oftentimes in the book, uh, spiritually immature persons are described as taking delight in bloodshed and conflict and contention and other sins. Um, they also become sad when they're unable to engage in, in this kind of behavior. And I think the correlation between pride and these two emotions is, is the idea that sin is pleasurable, right? Like, that's why we do it. That's why it's tempting to us. Um, and that's why it's hard for us not to do. Um, uh, often, if, for example, it's what author, offers us the path of least resistance. It's convenient. It's, it's what we want to do. So I think we all have to get to the point at which uh, we either abhor sin, we hate it, and are therefore naturally inclined to avoid it because it's just, you know, it's like seeing a dead animal or something like that. You just, you're grossed out by it. Or we have to get to the point at which we're able to rein in our desires for it. Finally, volitional. Um, pride is sometimes described as having a desire for sin, as I said, or things of no worth. Um, typically, people desire forms of wealth or things that visually set us apart from others, such as costly clothing or ornamentation. And clothing, as this, in, in this sense, acts as a kind of mechanism for separating ourselves, a mechanism for saying, I have more money than you, I look better than you, I'm above you. Uh, and this is why the Book of Mormon tends to idealize um, I think what it describes is uh, like plain clothing. Um, also, prioritizing one's desire over others. Uh, the wicked seek after power and authority and riches and the vain things of the world at the neglect of those who stand in need. 
And finally, pride, I think, assumes an, an unwillingness to correct course, to, to seek out and accommodate new information, insight, and revelation. Uh, we, we, go into, we go into our lives assuming that we have it all figured out. Um, and again, this is not a problem of the wicked persons first, but a problem of the righteous people. Um, so I think one lesson of the Book of Mormon is that disciples must recognize that what has been learned of discipleship may be correct, uh, but it's also partial. And that should be a starting point for searching after more exalted things. Now, in some, I think the problem is pr of pride, as I, would, I would, as I would categorize it, is that it orients inward rather than outward. Um, discipleship in the Book of Mormon is unmistakably other-centered and outward-oriented. And for this reason, it's fundamentally incompatible with pride. So, uh, so far I've discussed how Mormon frames prosperity as following righteousness and preceding pride. And of course, this isn't something that I'm the first to notice. Um, but this seems to be one of the main challenges of, of Book of Mormon people. How does one stop the cycle, right? How does one stop becoming prideful? in prosperity. Uh, for example, as Mormon reflects on some of the lessons to be learned from uh, this period of Nephite history, he laments, uh, unless we can behold, and I'm going to read this in its entirety, Sorry. unless we can behold the unsteadiness of the hearts of the children of men, yea, we can see that the Lord in his great infinite goodness doth bless and prosper those who put their trust in him. Yea, and we may see at the very time when he doth prosper his people, yea, in the increase of their fields, their flocks, and their herds, and in gold, and in silver, and in all manner of precious things of every kind, and art, sparing their lives, and delivering them out of the hands of their enemies, softening the hearts of their enemies that they should not declare wars against them, yea, and in fine doing all things for the welfare and happiness of his people, yea, then is the time that they do harden their hearts and do forget the Lord, their God, and do trample under their feet the Holy One. Yea, it is because of their ease and their exceedingly great prosperity. So this is idea here. Why is it that human nature is inclined to separate themselves from God when things are going well? Oh, how foolish and how vain and how evil and devilish and how quick to do iniquity and how slow to do e sorry, and how slow to do good are the children of men. Yea, how quick to hearken unto the words of the evil one, and to set their hearts upon the vain things of the world. Yea, how quick to be lifted up in pride. Yea, how quick to boast and to do all manner of that which is iniquity. And how slow are they to remember the Lord their God, and to give ear unto his counsels, and how slow to walk in wisdom's path. So you see Nephi is kind of looking over the history of his people, and this is the conclusion he reached, that human nature is flawed that we are inclined to revert back into our fallen state. And this is a problem that we have to overcome. Um, this has also been a concern of Latter-day Saints, uh, of, of modern-day Latter-day Saints and, and their leaders as well. So for example, Brigham Young said of the saints of his day, this people will stand mobbing, robbing, poverty, and all manner of persecution and be true. Excuse me. But my greater fear for them is that they cannot stand wealth. So again, this raises the question in my mind, how does one be righteous in prosperity? What precisely does that look like? And again, I hope you're, you're thinking about this question and we can discuss it a little more when I'm done speaking. Now, we get a few, uh, a few hints in Helaman uh, 1 through 6. Mormon tells us that the people who were righteous during this time, for example, they prayed and they fasted often. And it's worth noting that, that prayers and fasting in the Book of Mormon just as often as not uh, are often are offered with the intent to bless uh, persons other than the ones doing the praying and fasting. In other words, it's entirely possible that when Mormon is saying that what Mormon is saying here is that praying for the welfare of others in the midst of our challenges and difficulties is one way to be strengthened. Uh, or put a slightly different way, we are strengthened and made holy when we are not focused on our own welfare, but on that of others. And this reminds me of something that Elder Bednar taught. He said. Uh, and I'm quoting here, perhaps the greatest indicator of character is the capacity to recognize and appropriately respond to other people who are experiencing the very same challenge or adversity that is most immediately and forcefully pressing upon us. Character is revealed, for example, in the power to discern the suffering of other people when we ourselves are suffering, and the ability to detect the hunger of others when we are hungry. 
and in the power to reach out and extend compassion for the spiritual agony of others when we are in the midst of our own spiritual distress. Less character is demonstrated by looking and reaching outward when the natural and instinctive response is to be self-absorbed and turn inward." Close quote. And I think it relates to this idea too that prayer is not just a way to talk to God, but a way to conform our will to his, a will that is exclusively oriented towards uh, the development of his children. So I would suggest that perhaps focusing on others, both in times of trial and prosperity, serves uh, to make us the kind of people who can righteously navigate times of prosperity. Uh, Mormon also mentions that people increased in humility during this time. Um, humility is interesting to me because, it, to my knowledge, it's the only moral virtue that can be forced upon us to some degree. Uh, so, for example, Alma says, blessed are they who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble. And then he frames humility not as, as not having a stubborn heart. And then elsewhere, he idealizes those who humble themselves in whatsoever circumstances uh, they might be in. So he definitely prioritizes those who choose to be humble uh, over those who are, are forced to be humble. And that's the only moral attribute I'm aware of that can be kind of like, we can be compelled uh, to adapt. Um, that being said, one of the most impactful definitions of humility I've, I've heard comes from the writings of an ancient uh, Christian monk. Uh, he's not named, but in a text called The Sayings of the Desert Fathers, which records some of the wisdoms and, uh, wisdom and spiritual teachings of early Christian uh, disciples of Christ. Uh, when he was asked, what is humility? This is how he responds. He says, quote, humility is if you forgive a brother who has wronged you before he is sorry. And I love this idea of an openness to be and do good regardless of our external circumstances, regardless of what's going on. We are submissive to good, whatever that compels us to do. Um, Mormon tells us that the people grew firmer in their faith of Christ, which leads to joy and consolation. Um, so this term faith of Christ isn't often used in the Book of Mormon. It appears five times and is unique to the large plates. So everything after um, Mosiah, Mosiah and after. Uh, the term faith in Christ is more commonly used. It appears about 11 times. And I'm wondering, like, is this significant? Is there anything significant to the fact that the people became firmer in their faith of Christ as opposed to faith in Christ? And uh, my, the one thing I can think of is perhaps it suggests, or rather faith of Christ suggests that it's, it's more than belief in the Savior, but it's emulating or mirroring the faith that he himself possesses. Faith of Christ, um, la fe de Cristo, is like, it's something, that he, it's something that is his, right? So to possess that and to emulate that is to, yeah, exactly, to, to mirror it, to mirror it. It's not just belief in him, it's having the kind of faith and commitment he has. Um, finally, people yield their hearts to God, which leads them to purification and sanctification. Um, we can read this verse in light of what we talked about uh, with respect to the heart. So at the, very, at the very least, I think, yielding one's heart to God might entail conforming our thoughts and desires and emotions to his. Um, so there's a, a significant distinction, I think, for example, between doing what God wants and wanting what God wants. And I think he wants us to get to the point at which our desires are in conformity with his. Um, I think, for example, in our most noble moments, we can all experience to some degree what it is to see and feel and think like the Savior. Um, in these moments of being one like him, we can know what it's like to truly love a stranger, for example, or to forgive an enemy without reservation or to abhor sin. Um, I think all of us who have experienced the influence of the Holy Spirit recognize what it is to see with new eyes and then recognize once that spirit leaves that, okay, I can see I've gotten, a, I've gotten an aspirational vision of what I need to become. And now that the spirit has left me, I see what I need to work towards. Now, if we ask ourselves what else the Book of Mormon says about righteousness and prosperity, uh, much of what we would find would relate to the proper attitude toward and use of wealth. Um, so maybe I'll go through a few of those principles and then I'll finish up and we can discuss uh, what are your, some of your thoughts regarding how might one be righteous in prosperity? How might one keep life in that line of communication and other centeredness when things are going well for us? Um, so proper attitude towards wealth. What does the Book of Mormon tell us? Uh, and I choose wealth here, recognizing that wealth is not the only form of prosperity, that wealth is a, a very relative term. Um, I don't consider myself wealthy. 
um, by the standards of my neighbors or the people I associate with, but I understand that wealth looks different in different countries and times and places. Uh, but I'm, I'm speaking broadly here of the money we have, how should we have, or the resources we have, how should we feel towards them? So King Benjamin taught uh, a century prior to the time that we're talking about now that uh, wealth does not belong to you, but to God. Um, so I think uh, understanding the nature of wealth can be, can be a transformative experience. Uh, Mormon tells us that the Nephites' problem was that they, they really fundamentally misunderstood their relationship to wealth. They assumed that they were the owners of the wealth they possessed rather than stewards of it. And this is important because an owner does what she wants with what she possesses, but stewards are accountable to a master for their use of wealth. They, they, they act in accordance with the master's wishes. And I think this is the kind of uh, perspective that the Lord wants us to have on the material resources we have. Those aren't ours. Those are stewardship given to us by God for which we will be held accountable at some point. Um, Book of Mormon authors also consistently teach that one is not to lust after, desire, covet, or love the things of the world, such as gold, silver, glory, silks, scarlets, whatever that is, fine twine linen, and precious clothing. And I think the implication here is that wealth should not be a principal object of one's affections, uh, nor should it be sought out for its own sake or to increase one's status, uh, which is to say the primary value that wealth should have for us is its potential to help us accomplish what God considers good. This is what I get from my reading in the Book of Mormon. Having a heart drawn out to the Lord is important. Um, throughout the large plates, persons are often chastised for having set their hearts upon riches. Um, again, we can refer back to what the heart is and what having our hearts set on riches might imply. Um, but at the very least, I think it implies that our thoughts and desires are, and feelings are occupied with acquiring and retaining wealth. In fact, there are no instances in the Book of Mormon in which, in which uh, one's heart being set upon wealth in any degree is a good thing. Granted, the Book of Mormon also talks about how we should provide for ourselves and our families, um, but at the same time, the phrase heart set upon wealth, it's exclusively negative. Um, Samuel the Lamanite teaches that a properly oriented heart must be drawn out unto the Lord. And this is something he closely associates with obedience to God and expressing sincere gratitude and remembering the source of the blessings that we have. Uh, next, a willingness to part with wealth. So several authors emphasize uh, cultivating this kind of willingness, this detachedness. Uh, so Lehi, for example, he's presented as fleeing Jerusalem and leaving all his wealth behind. Amulek does the same thing. Lamoni says, I will give up all that I possess and forsake my kingdom for God. So we can ask ourselves, would we be able to say this as well? Uh, in these passages, faithful individuals obviously prioritize the will of God over retaining their material possessions and gaining more. And then Jesus goes on to add that a person should be willing to give more wealth or rather to give more than is asked of them, to give also a cloak when only a coat is requested, he says. Um, King Benjamin adds to this that those who don't have disposable uh, wealth are still required to cultivate a certain kind of disposition. He says, quote, I say unto the poor, I mean all you who deny the beggar because you have not. I would that ye say in your hearts that I give not because I have not, but if I had, I would give. And now if you say this in your hearts, you remain guiltless, otherwise you are condemned. So here, a willingness to part with wealth is required even if giving is not a possibility. And again, say this in your hearts. It's not just, oh, if I think this, I'm okay. It's really having the desire, the intent, the sincerity being there. It's part of who we are. Um, so elsewhere, several statements relate to how those who possess wealth should perceive themselves and others. Uh, Benjamin, for example, says that uh, people should see themselves, that the rich and poor alike should see themselves as beggars. Uh, quote, behold, are we not all beggars? Do we not all depend upon the same being, even God, for all the substance which we have, both food and raiment and all that we possess of every kind? Um, Mosiah and Jacob also teach that we should think of our brothers and sisters like unto ourselves. We should esteem them as our neighbors. And it seems like these authors are attempting to undermine the tendency to look down upon those who solicit help. If those with wealth see themselves as needy, they might, be, they might also see themselves in the needy and thus be more inclined to offer them support. 
Um, Benjamin also commands his people to suspend judgment and to not assume that a poor person, quote, uh, has brought this misery upon himself or that poverty is a just punishment for sin. So what this suggests in my mind is that while economic prosperity is frequently correlated to righteousness in the Book of Mormon, uh, financial status is ultimately not a reliable metric of divine favor. Uh, in other words, temporal prosperity is not always the consequence of righteousness, and that's, I think, obvious enough for most of us. Now, finishing up real quick, uh, having this kind of attitude towards wealth is what enables an individual to use wealth properly, uh, according to Mormon and other authors in the Book of Mormon. And the proper use of wealth looks something like this, and I'll try to go through this a little quicker. Um, you don't spend wealth on that which is of no worth, says Jacob, but rather with the intent to do good. Uh, several passages uh, speak generally to the moral imperative, imperative to give justly and generously, excuse me, or as Jacob says, to be familiar and free with your substance. Benjamin teaches that one should give to the needy in wisdom and order, meaning that everyone should give, quote, according to that which he hath. Um, he also states that a person should administer to those in need according to their wants. Um, so Benjamin expects his people really to exercise prudence by considering both their own financial situation and uh, the desires of those in need. Uh, he also appears to acknowledge the danger of giving too much when he says that we shouldn't run faster than we have strength and that all things should be done in order. Um, Alma, of course, adds to this that we should give more abundantly if we have more abundantly. Um, we shouldn't use religion as an excuse not to give. Nephi says specifically that we shouldn't rob the poor for the sake of maintaining fine sanctuaries. And I think at the very least, this suggests that the beauty of our religion uh, should be reflected first and foremost in the character and conduct of its adherents, rather than a kind of a visual splendor. Finally, several authors specify the classes of people to whom wealth should be given. Uh, they name specifically the poor, naked, hungry, captive, sick, afflicted, and needy. Uh, the Book of Mormon portrays God as consistently and deeply invested in these persons' welfare, and he, they, it pronounces strict judgment on those who mistreat or marginalize them. So while the possession of wealth is, is not a reliable, again, barometer of moral character in the text, an individual or community's treatment of those in need is. So in, in conclusion, Jesus sees himself in the marginalized and disadvantaged of society. He didn't just care for the poor, he was poor. He didn't just minister to ethnic minorities in the Roman Empire, he was one. He was also a refugee, he was convicted of a crime, uh, he was the victim of government-sanctioned oppression. In other words, Christ's ministry to the marginalized was not just a charitable condescension to their level. From the day he was born to the day he died, he was one of them. And I think forgetting this risks inhibiting our ability to understand and love and serve and see as equals those who are similarly marginalized in modern society. I think there's power in trying to see Christ in those who we are more accustomed to ignore or look down upon. And I think this is one lesson that Mormon wants us to learn as he narrates the fall of the Nephite civilization to us in these chapters. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, um, I'm interested if people have any thoughts or um, let me stop sharing real quick. If anybody of our listeners have any thoughts or comments or insights regarding, you know, anything that came to their mind or maybe how we might be righteous in prosperity um, or any questions or comments or jokes or whatever. <laughs> yeah, lots of, lots of great um, comments. I guess uh, one that I was especially interested in having you um, talk to us about um, is, let's see if I can find it actually, uh, is a comment that brings up that there are uh, different types of prosperity. And one of those is wealth, uh, but we also see political prosperity, political power. And mm -hmm. so um, how might we think about um, these scriptures and the lessons of um, how to act righteously in prosperity if we're thinking about political power. Um, how can we be moral in relation to political wealth? Um, or then the opposite, um, how can we be righteous in the absence of political prosperity? Yeah, and by political prosperity, are you meaning kind of uh, the ability to influence society or something that to that effect? Yeah, so... Um, 
so the comment talks about, it seems that the deepest flaws in Nephite culture are embodied by the Gadian robbers. And although wealth is one of their motivations, political power is another, Kishkumen and then um, Gadianton's actions, um, you know, they serve up as a primary motivation. Yeah. For them. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the, the, the consistent, I hope I've drawn this out, the consistent theme in the Book of Mormon is that if you want to be righteous really in any circumstance and you, senses, you have to be outward oriented and other centered. Um, and this only works obviously in a community in the community in which everybody feels that way. But I mean, leveraging influence and access to education and uh, um, you know, really whatever political or capital we have in our society to lifting up those who are marginalized and giving them the opportunity to uh, contribute to society uh, in, in productive ways that contribute to the common good. And this is something we see spelled out more explicitly in Fourth Nephi, uh, in which you have kind of the elision of uh, or the erasure of tribal tribalism and um, social stratification. All people are considered uh, children of God, and the way Mormon describes it is they had all things all things in common. And I don't think this is referring to just to kind of material resources, but just they cared for one another. Like they knew each other's needs. They were looking out for one another, and the decisions they made they did in in light of what would help the most vulnerable among them. So that might be part of it. Yeah, somebody but, following up to this uh, conversation um, is asking, it seems to me political power is even more seductive sometimes than wealth. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe comment on that? Yeah. And I would be, I mean, I don't want to put Savannah on the spot, but uh, <laughs> I, she kind of wades in, in this territory a little bit more than I. Um, but if, I don't know if you have any comments or thoughts on that, the kind of relationship between political influence and power and righteousness. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to take any of your time, Daniel. The only yeah. thing I would say is that I think they are, they're so closely intertwined, right? Both, they're like stepping stones interconnected. The more, the more political power you usually have in our country, usually are able to aggregate more wealth. Um, yeah. And yeah, and, and increase your, your status and the, the circles in which you operate that way. And it, I think they're just to your point, I think they, they, the um, tendency, the temptation to become poisoned by all of that just increases the higher up you get, for sure. Yeah. Nicole, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that or? I would also just add that the political power and wealth of the individual to use their voice to bring about the good um, for the greater community is also something that we should capitalize more on. Yeah, and recognizing my sphere of influence is, is really small. Um, so, I mean, it takes, I take comfort in the fact knowing that sometimes even if there are political ideologies that are uh, normative that I don't agree with, at least within my small sphere of influence, I can create, you know, within the context of my classroom, for example, I can create a kind of microcosm for the world I think we should live in, which is appreciates diversity and inclusion and is really kind of trying to lift up the marginalized, but yeah. I hope that kind of got at the question. Sorry if we bounced around a little bit. Yeah, I, there's, there's another direction that uh, comes up in, in a couple of questions here. That is uh, the feeling that um, helping others makes us less, diminishes me. I, I read it as, I mean, the particular question has to do with housing, providing affordable housing or providing um, it makes providing for the homeless in our neighborhoods makes us feel like our property values go down. And somehow that strikes a different part of our, uh, a different part of our brain than um, giving of our wealth, giving of ourselves, somehow the, the feeling that we are made less, uh, made lesser, that we are harmed by what we do for others is is striking a different part of our of our heart, I suppose, to go back to your comments. Yeah. And Mormon seems to ignore, and I mean, just to add to that, it's not just that we feel like our property values go down, it's that they actually do, right? And that's something you have to remember. But I mean, that seems to be really the disposition and, and cares that Mormon seems to be pushing back against. He's like, he recognized that's a part of our inherent human nature, um, but living in Christ looks different than that. And I think part of the call is to recognize, you know, where are our priorities? So, and I think that's something that people would have to answer individually. 
So you've talked, um, I appreciated you talking about um, both kind of conduct as individuals as well as um, by, as a society or as an organization or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of comments that talk about um, kind of the ethics of both personal and corporate or organizational wealth and, and how that gets directed. Mm -hmm. um, and some questions about um, kind of the, the church's prosperity and, um, and what's happening kind of with that. And uh, going along with that, there was a, a recent comment about what are the advantages and disadvantages of having an organization led, influenced by fiscally successful versus the common but equally righteous person. And I think that kind of brings in some, some more of this idea. Um, some thoughts so, so if i understand you correctly you want me to publicly talk about the church's <laughs> financials <laughs> um i i, I practices maybe maybe not exactly <laughs> that but um kind of how do we how do we kind of reconcile and think about um those kinds of questions um i think it poses some some difficulties yeah. Um, no, um, you're talking about kind of the visible manifestations of wealth versus yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of the con, you know, the conduct, mm -hmm. um, and what's what's prioritized or how do they work together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, so I'll I'll share what I think, and then maybe Savannah and Nicole can can chime in if they have any thoughts. Um, and I hope this isn't just a cop out. But I, I take comfort in the fact that I have a very, like I said, very small. Uh, sphere of influence. So if, you know, the political party I affiliate with or the church I affiliate with is, is doing things that I don't agree with, like I, I can do what I want with my money. Um, again, I'm not suggesting, you know, go pay tithing or anything like that. But if there are causes that I'm, I'm passionate about, like I'll give to those causes. If there are people I feel like I want to reach out to, I should do it. Um, I think, let me see how to word this. I think sometimes we can feel like we are accomplishing things and maybe we are. I'm, I've talked to my sister a little bit about this and I'm, I'm fairly um, pessimistic when it comes to kind of like online activism and things like that. But if people are trying to do good things within their sphere of influence, I think that's a step. Uh, and some good things I think are more effective than others. But, and I realize I'm maybe not getting at the question specifically, but that's really all I can say. I mean, we all have our agency and we can all Kind of contribute to the causes and and you know prop up the ideologies that we we feel are in line with with discipleship within our own individual spheres. Savannah yeah. and Nicole, would you have any? Um, I think the just I don't know if this exactly gets at the question, but one thing I've been thinking about recently um, is that I think we can be completely well intentioned and well meaning, but still be misinformed or still not quite see all of the nuances and complexity of the particular issue we're trying to solve or the group of people we're trying to help. Um, and so I think, um, and the, I think as we continue to try and work and strive for the causes we do think are good, it's just really important to not have, you know, tunnel vision and to continue to seek out voices different than ours and to continue to really strive to listen to understand, not to listen to respond. Um, and I also think as you, as you increase in power um, and, and status, it becomes harder to do that because you are more likely to be inclined into that tunnel vision. Um, it's hard to constantly be on guard to, to not be stuck into your own. I'm, I know what I'm trying to do is really good. And so I'm totally well-meaning. I'm doing everything the best I can, but you really have to be careful about that because I think that we can get really comfortable and that causes problems for um, for ourselves sometimes but also for the people we may be trying to help. Yeah, yeah and I think that really fits with what you were saying Daniel about kind of um, definitions of and, and, and characteristics associated with humility mm -hmm. um, that that kind of came out um, yeah. in your discussion of that. Nicole did you have something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to echo what you said about us having agency and the ability to take our wealth or our resources or ideas and put them in places where um, our hearts lead us to. I don't know very much about the church's finances, um, but I do know that when we are, when we are, when you grow up steeped in a culture, sometimes the tendency is to 
allocate your resources to that institution or that religion or that political party or, or whatever the, the thing is to the neglect of other things. Um, and so not, no one institution can solve all of humanity's problems. So the more time that you take to identify things that your heart is drawn to, um, the more diverse our ability to help people and help our communities will be. And I think it's important to add too, it's not just the ability we have, but I mean, it's part of our covenants, right? To consecrate all that we have to doing good, to building the kingdom. Yeah, I really like that, that kind of um, members of the, as a member of the church I know for a long time, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm one and done if I send in my donation to the church, but, um, but it often kind of kept me from looking um, elsewhere and, 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 and supporting um, other organizations and causes that are doing important work. I think we also see, um, at least I've seen the church responding to people's um, desires to do greater good in the world. Um, and we have a kind of perpetual education fund and um, so many humanitarian projects that I think um, just have been able to, to take off and do um, good work because of uh, how grassroots members are responding to, um, to those opportunities. Jumping in with uh, kind of a follow-up question, although I'm synthesizing it here. Doesn't that, doesn't this discussion draw us into judging the other, into deciding where, where our giving would be most valuable or most effective, and that draws us into um, who is worthy of, or who is entitled to, or who is the the which is the good source or the good the 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 good asker, I suppose. Yeah, yeah let me bring in this specific comment that speaks to that because I really like the way this is framed. Um, um, Rosalind Eve says, I think there's definitely a danger of pride in giving. Too often we set up a dy dynamic where the giver is superior to the one receiving the gift. Um, and Benjamin's uh, reminder that all our beggars dependent on God is important. So, uh, and you brought that out in your definition of humility. Uh, and maybe our giving should be dictated by the needs of, of people we want to help and respecting their ideas and agency rather than giving what we think that they they need that and it takes us into this idea of proximity um brian stevenson and others have have talked about and i mean jesus himself he gives a, he says you know let not your right hand know what your left hand doeth or, or vice versa this idea that we shouldn't dwell too much on our own philanthropy um because that can do damage we shouldn't allow our goodness to again s set us above other people um and i, I forget the second point you made uh, savannah nicole did you have any additional thoughts on uh, just real quickly, I really, that's an idea I really love, the idea about like going proximity to the community we're trying to serve. Gloria Steinem tells this story about when she was young on a field trip, they were like by a beach and she saw a turtle that was trying to cross the street and like go inland. And she went and picked up the turtle to try and save it and put it back in the water. And her teacher told her, why did you do that? Like that turtle was trying to get somewhere to, to lay eggs or something. And now you've totally messed with its path. And he said, and, and she said her whole one of her um, like mottos for her life's work has always been ask the turtle, which is kind of like yeah. a, funny way to, a funny way to think about it. But I always think about that because I really think like you get, we get panels of people who are really trying to do a lot of good work and, and help communities or demographics that need help, but no one is going to ask, you know, and say, yeah. what do you need? Like, do you agree with the initiatives we're trying to take? Like, and I think that happens in the church at the micro level, at the macro level. I think that happens in politics. I think that happens all over the place. So Ask the turtle. Ask the turtle. That's the takeaway. Yeah. Ask the turtle. <laughs> and two, I mean, just to just to Christian's point too, it's like I don't I don't need your approval to give, you know, money to a cause I want. So in terms of you know adjudicating which is better, like that's that's at least in my mind, I don't need anybody's approval to give to a cause that I want to give to. So uh, it, I don't feel a responsibility to say this is a cause worthy of your money if it's if it's worthy of my money. But or any, any resource. Again, it's not all financial. Sometimes my sister, for example, teaches ESL sometimes for free. Um, you know, I've taught English classes for, for free. Like, I mean, again, wealth, broadly speaking. 
Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that uh, the first thing that I heard when was it Michael or Christian who gave the, the comment? Um, the first thing that I thought of is how do I use my sphere of influence um, and the way in which I allocate my, my wealth? How do I use that and then help others feel inspired to use theirs in a way that um, maybe they haven't thought of or that they might want to do, but um, for some reason or other haven't? That's a struggle that I have. How do I, how do I remain humble? and use my wealth in a responsible way, but also encourage others to use theirs in a responsible. So unlike you, Daniel, I do feel like I yeah. need to sort of <laughs> yeah. tell people what I'm doing, not sort of to pat myself on the back, um, but to inspire them. Um, but the, the slippery slope is that then if they don't do something, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna let them have their free will or am I going to judge them? Um, and so and that was kind just of a, yeah. And there's kind of even a tension in the scriptural imperative. I mean, because Jesus says, you know, let your light so shine, but also don't, uh, what is the other one? Don't, jeez, uh, oh, you're going to have to edit this. <laughs> so let your light so shine, but don't do your good works to be seen of men. So this idea that, you know, yeah. that there's a balance there we, that we each have to, yeah, we each have to kind of navigate. So something I've been thinking about during your lesson um, is that, uh, you know, these, these scriptures are directed toward the prosperous, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and how, how can you be right, righteous um, in prosperity? And, um, and it seems that the New Testament and Christ's life is very, is in some ways the opposite, right? So how mm -hmm. do the dispossessed operate in the world? Yeah. Um, and that's what I tried to, I mean, by mentioning prosperity looks different for other people. It doesn't have to necessarily be like monetary uh, resources, but I think we all have, I mean, we all have things, no matter how destitute we are in some sense, we all have things to give, even if it's just, you know, a hug or something like that. That sounds trite, but sometimes that goes a long way. Um, and then again, the scriptures give um, instructions regarding people who don't have disposable wealth, you know, cultivate a desire to give if you could. Don't judge people. Look at people the same way that you see yourselves. Um, so are diff there are different ways to kind of emulate Christ likeness, even if it's not in the monetary in monetary exchanges. But yeah, I don't know, Nicole, Savannah, any other? No. No, I I jump in with uh, I call it my own comment because I can't quite get this from any one of the chat comments. I I, I appreciate the way you start with pride as um, as an extreme, as a too much. I mean, when we talk about virtues, that's um, probably not one extreme or the other, but some kind of balance. And so it feels like we're talking about giving, about using uh, the wealth we have um, without, a, without a right answer, without a right answer that says, I can do all of this or I can do none of that, but some form of paying attention but not too much and, and some uh, could i draw you back out on, on on that point can can you do that a little bit more concisely sorry <laughs> um, <laughs> we in this kind of conversation we often uh -huh. we often look for an answer that says do everything for that for that person who asks yeah, or yeah. do nothing until we've judged them righteous mm -hmm. or uh we we look for an answer that is black and white or that is um, one extreme and it feels like you are talking about the heart in a way that um, suggests um paying attention to those in need but not taking too much uh, attention uh, not yeah. focus and, and that there's some kind of um, and I, I, I want to draw you out on that point that it's it this is the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing but still paying enough attention to let your light shine I, I, that's yeah yeah and I've thought about this a lot too because I mean I think sometimes in the church we see other people as a means to an end like I'm going to help this person so I can get blessings but it's not born of a desire to just sincerely help them um, 
And I think Heavenly Father, I mean, if, if I were to give a hierarchy of proper motivations, which I think is at the heart of this discussion for, for doing good, you know, at the bottom might be fear. You do good because you don't want to go to hell. You don't want to get punished. You don't want people to come attack you. Uh, maybe above that, duty. You do good because it's what you do. It's what you're raised to do. It's what you feel like you have to do. Above that is a, a promise of reward. You do good because you want to be blessed. And then above that, I think the highest um, the highest ideal motivation is, is love. You do good because it's a natural expression of who you are. And I think spiritual formation, maturation, creating a Zion-like community is very much a, by, a byproduct of just loving people. It's, it's not something that can be sought out for its own sake. And, and this is the kind of space that we have to navigate in because we, we should be trying to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord. But at the same time, a lot of that change that's going to happen to us is the product of not trying to work out our own salvation. It's a product of just getting to the point at which you want to help and love people. Um, and again, it's a balance. And I think Benjamin recognizes this. Uh, he says, you know, do these good things in wisdom and order. You know, it's not me that somebody should run faster than they have power. So yeah, and again, it's hard to, it's hard to give a, uh, an overarching principle that's applicable to all persons. But I think that's kind of the beauty of it is, uh, you know, with the spirit, we can all uh, tailor our giving, like um, Savannah and Nicole were saying, uh, to, to learn the love language of other people, in a sense, to understand how our gift, uh, gifted service it would be best translated into um, to love in, in their eyes. I don't know if that answers your, your question, Christian. I apologize if I didn't. No, it answers beautifully. I, in fact, that's the comment I wanted to draw from you. So I guess oh, okay. it's perfect. <laughs> Next time, just say it, and I'll say I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so folks have commented that um, that it you know boils down to love God and love your neighbors, right? And that in many ways, what we're seeing here and your explanation for um, kind of about humility uh, is about helping us to get to that spot and and a kind of checklist. If we're doing these things and we're loving our neighbors, and if we're not, then our heart is not oriented um, in the right place. Right, at the, at the same time, I love this comment that was, uh, that I'm going to take as saying, if someone is doing good out of a sense of duty and is not at Daniel's highest level of moral hierarchy, it's still doing good. And yeah, we, and so is fear. Yeah, like, not to be judging others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and we ought not to be judging others on where they stand in that in that hierarchy. Yeah. At the same time that we're that we're teaching, there is there is yeah. more. There is there is more to talk about. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, again, I didn't mean to suggest that one was bad and one was good. I think they're all good, but I also think one is probably better than others. And yeah, yeah, and I think that goes along with your. I loved you kind of talking about the function of the heart in the Book of Mormon and the and and it being the seat of pride and you know what is the process by where we get our heart not to be the seat of pride and that mm -hmm. might entail um, you know some of that I don't know if you want to say just a little bit more about I I just love that um, that idea of the function of the heart um, in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Okay, just a little bit more about that. Yeah, so the, the human person in the Book of Mormon, so typically when we think of what's called theological anthropology, the technical term for it, but just how human nature is conceptualized in the Book of Mormon. Um, so we tend to think of it as spirit body, which equals the soul. Uh, in the Book of Mormon, there is a spirit, a body, a mind, uh, flesh, and a uh, heart. And heart is typically the one that does the most work. Uh, and there's a lot of overlap between them, but it's really the, it's really the, the, it represents the entire person, um, typically. And sometimes it's described as hard, and sometimes it's described as soft. And if you were to kind of go through and map out what hard hearts do and soft hearts do, um, you can see what a good person looks like on a real intimate psychological level. What does a good person feel? What do they think? Um, and I'll just give two examples. Uh, one, of the, one of the most common emotional uh, manifestations of spiritual maturity is that a person takes um, sorrow in the suffering of others. So for example, Christ groans at the sin of others. Uh, Nephi sorrows over the sins of his family. Um, and another emotional sign of spiritual maturation is you take joy in the successes of others. 
um, the angels and God rejoice at the faith of the people. J Jesus's joy becomes full when the Nephites pray and he sees their faith. Uh, so again, it's this idea that your heart is not your own. Uh, it's one. It, it's connected. It overlaps with other people such that their joys are your joys, their sorrows are your sorrows. And this seems to be what God wants us to work towards, this idea of uh, being one and oneness and kinship. Uh, and this is definitely how we understand the celestial kingdom of these bonds of families and friends. And um, I think this kind of idea of oneness offers a paradigm for what we should be striving for now. And the heart seems to be a kind of a, a productive metaphor for that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for this beautiful lesson. Thanks to everyone for participating. Uh, we will close today with a prayer, which will be offered by Savannah Bur Burgoyne, and hope you will join us next week when we explore more of Helaman with Professor Andrea Radke Moss. Uh, Savannah is Daniel's sister-in-law, and we're happy that we, she's been able to participate in our discussion uh, today. She lives and works as an attorney in Washington, D.C., uh, with her husband and toddler daughter. Uh, Savannah earned a bachelor's degree in political science and international studies at Yale, a master's in secondary education and teaching at Arizona State after working in Phoenix through the Teach for America program, and her JD is from Georgetown University Law Center. Our dear and gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to come together this morning um, and be edified by Daniel's lesson and by the comments that have been shared by so many of the participants here. We're so grateful for the technology that has allowed us to gather together today to do this virtually. We're so grateful for Daniel for his preparation and the time that he spent thinking about these texts and these topics and so grateful for the spirit that has worked through him. We're so thankful for the Book of Mormon and for these sacred texts that help us draw closer to our heavenly parents. Please help us, Father, as we go about our week this week after this lesson that we can strive for humility to work against pride to strive to orient ourselves outwards instead of inwards and to have faith both in and of Christ and to continue to reach outside of our comfort zone um, and, and try to see ourselves in those who are marginalized or who are in need and to be more willing and eager to share and to comfort and to listen. We pray for our health and safety in these times of unrest and for peace and for calm for all of us and for a renewed effort to come unto Christ and be sanctified in him. We're so grateful for all of our many blessings and all that thou hast given us. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.